Noah. Hi. Welcome to Drinking the Kool Aid. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Megan. I'm Hannah. What's wrong with you? I don't know. I just wanted to see what you would do if I did that. I don't like that at all. <laughs> um. <sighs> okay. Well, we're done with our Halloween spooky <laughs> series. I'm just trying to ignore I you. Know you are. Move right along <sighs> here. It makes it so much better. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, tell your story. Listen. Oh, first, I do want to say, uh, hopefully everybody liked the gnarly music at the beginning and end of our podcast. That was by Isaac Stangler. There you Shout go. Shout out. Love you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, he currently does all of the music, and we wanted to do those ones just for the Halloween stuff, so. Cool. So, for our podcast today, we're going to be covering the case of Martha Moxley. Cool. And stop it, you! (laughs) I'm having way too much fun. I'm going to throw something at you in a second. (laughs) If you hear anything in the background of this, you know what happened. I might, well, I wouldn't throw a bottle of tequila. No. I wouldn't. Okay. But if you hear a clink. Okay. (laughs) Uh, If I hear a clink, you're taking a shot? Yes. (laughs) Me too. Of course. (laughs) A ton of the research that I did came from the book, The Mysterious Murder of Martha Moxley by Joe Bruno. And I also watched The uh, Murder and Justice, The Case of Martha Moxley on Oxygen. And that's a three-part series. And it's really good. (laughs) All right. 15-year-old Martha Moxley was a straight-A student from Greenwich, Connecticut. She was described as an all-American girl who was a flirt. She loved attention from boys, but wasn't really promiscuous. She was pretty, popular, confident, and self-assured. She was voted the girl with the best personality in her junior high class. Okay, always. I know. It's always straight A's and always, like, voted the best or the prettiest or some shit. Like, if thank God that, like, I'm still alive and shit, because, like, if you had to do one on me, it'd be, like, the straight D and F student that, like... Only some people like, some people hated the bitch. (laughs) And sometimes she barked at people. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god! Would you you just give that up? I was a child. Okay. Well, Um, I mean... Mine would be like, Yeah. Okay, student. Hid in the back. Didn't talk to anybody. Wore glitter all the time. (laughs) Yeah. We were very opposite. Yeah. Very disruptive over here, like, Mm -hmm. yeah, was not the quiet one. (laughs) That was never me. Yeah, it still isn't. Anyways. Well, uh, Martha took ballet lessons, played piano, and enjoyed skiing and tennis. She also lettered in field hockey and basketball. (laughs) I'm just saying. Hannah lettered in sitting on her ass. Hey, we've all got something. (laughs) On October 30th, 1975, she was brutally murdered and it took 25 years to convict somebody. But the case isn't really solved. What? Yeah, this is really a confusing case. Martha was last seen at the Skakel family home across the street from her house in Belhaven. She was hanging out with teenage brothers Tommy and Michael Skakel. Their father, Rushton Skakel, was the heir to a family fortune from the coal industry. Their father's sister was Ethel Skakel, who was the wife of Robert F. Kennedy, brother of the assassinated president, John F. Kennedy. Well, damn! Yeah. In Belhaven, the night before Halloween is referred to as mischief or Hell Night. It's a night where children and teens are involved in pranks, vandalism, and other activities. Oh my god, fun. (laughs) And the pranksters would ring doorbells and toilet paper houses. Well, the pranks, not the vandalism. Right. 
Bellhaven was a neighborhood with its own yacht club, private security, and it was a really tight-knit group of people. On October 30th, Martha's mother began calling people to see if they had seen her daughter, and it was believed that she went to see her boyfriend, Jeffrey Gray, that night. Everyone assumed Martha was just participating in Mischief Night, you know, no big deal. Once the sun came up, the whole town was looking for Martha. The neighbor, uh, Sheila McGuire, joined the search to find Martha, and she was 15 years old. And so she went to all the local makeout spots in town, and she wandered through a deserted patch of grass and trees that was located on the northwest side of the Moxley property. She was at the top of a slope and spotted something at the bottom. Oh, no. And it kind of looked like a blue mattress with, like, a pink sleeping bag on top. As Sheila was heading down the slope, the image in front of her began turning into something else completely different as her eyes were adjusting. She found her friend, Martha, lying on her stomach. Her feet were pointed towards the slope, and her head was pointed towards her house. She was wearing navy blue corduroy jeans, and they were down to her ankles. Oh. So she was naked from the waist down, and she was wearing a navy jacket. Martha was covered in blood, pine needles, and debris. She had been scratched all down her hips and thighs, and blood was in her hair. Tears were streaming down Sheila's face as she processed everything, and she took off running to Martha's house. She was screaming. She found Martha, and she believed that maybe she had been, you know, raped or attacked by dogs and needed help. A ceremony was held for Martha on November 4th, and the eulogy was written by her classmates. They said they all thought about death before, and Martha told her friends that she would want everybody to be happy at her funeral and remember all of the good times they had. I know. The students wrote, quote, Martha was a happy girl who made friends easily and brightened the lives of everyone she met. Martha Moxley loved life. Every day was something special. She made more friends in only a short time in Greenwich than most people made in a lifetime. She was always the first to come around, and she was fun to be around. It was an education to be with her. The Moxley family was the perfect foursome. They enjoyed tennis, skiing, and dinner together. Martha loved her family as well as her $100 cat and her collection of frogs. Her hundred dollar cat. Yeah. That's so specific. (laughs) But Uh, I love it. Yes. (laughs) And her collection of frogs. Right. Now, it appears that Martha was heading home for the night because her body was discovered in her own yard. Based on the evidence from the crime scene, it's believed that she was hit in the head when she was on her driveway. She was hit with a golf club so hard that the club shattered into four pieces. (gasps) What? Yeah. And also, I do want to mention, uh, based on the time frame, it wasn't a wooden golf club. Oh, my God. The head of the club has slanted grooves, and the imprint of that design was on her chin. Police surveyed the scene and found two... Imprint? Yeah, imprinted in her skin. Oh my god. Yeah. That is some serious force. Yeah, exactly. And police surveyed the scene and found two pools of blood, and the path led them directly to Martha's body. They found three pieces of the Tony Penna six iron golf club, which was the murder weapon. A retired detective, Steve Carroll, would admit years later that the investigation was really disorganized in the beginning. The first theory that police came to was that the murder was committed by an outsider of the community, such as a hitchhiker who just slipped through the Bellhaven security. When they couldn't find any evidence to fit the theory, they concluded it was probably somebody local. Bellhaven was a pretty safe, upscale, rich community. 
They had 63,000 people there, and there wasn't a lot of crime. And there certainly hadn't been any recent murders. Detectives were trying to piece together Martha's last hours, and here's what they came up with. Martha Moxley, Helen X, and Jeffrey Byrne arrived at the Skakel residence around 8.30 p.m. on Mischief Night. On Mischief Night, I just love it. Right? Martha and Michael Skakel got in the front seat of his father's car. Helen and Jeffrey were seated in the back. They were just sitting in the vehicle, you know, being kids, listening to music, and Tommy Skakel came out of the house drunk and hopped into the front seat with Martha. Tommy and Michael are brothers, and they didn't get along at all, like sibling rivalry to the max. Okay. Martha may have had a crush on Tommy, but Michael for sure had a crush on Martha. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. Drama! So drunk Tommy, when he gets into the car, he starts running his hands down Martha's inner thighs. Ew, okay. And then she kind of, you know, giggled and was like, okay, stop that, you know. No, you don't giggle. You just fucking move their hand. Right. Yeah. Well, who knows? Maybe she was into it. I'm not sure. He did pull his hand back, but began flirting with Martha in front of his brother. Around 9.15 p.m., more siblings came out of the Skakel house and announced they were going to watch Monty Python at Jimmy's house. Yes! And they asked if anybody wanted to go with. Michael said he wanted to go and asked Martha... You know, do you want to go with? But she declined that invitation. Uh, That could have been maybe because she might have had a crush on Tommy and he said he wasn't going. Or because she had to get home for curfew. The car full of teens drove off. Helen and Jeffrey left the home on foot. And then it was just Tommy and Martha left. All stories after this point have changed many times over the years. Helen and Jeffrey say that the last time they saw Martha was with Tommy. The two of them were flirting as they were leaving the Skakel home. Tommy Skakel says that he last saw Martha around 9.30 p.m. as she was walking back to her house, which was about 200 yards away. Martha had been on her property when she was hit in the head with a golf club several times. Which makes it so much, like, ickier. Because she was right there. Because she was so close to Uh being able... Yeah, and it's like, the fact that she was literally only... What did you say, like, 200 yards? 200 yards is all she had to go. And that's so fucking scary. Yeah. That all she had to walk was 200 yards and she still, like, you know, something still happened. Right, exactly. It just shows that you literally cannot let your guard down for a second no the killer hit her an additional 10 to 15 times after she was unconscious and that's believed to be when the golf club shattered into the four pieces okay so that's like overkill right and that sounds yes almost personal very because typically when you know when it's like that it's more personal because that's a lot Especially after, you know, she's gone. Exactly. And that does come up later in here, too. Okay. Um, As we're going to... I'm going to present several suspects to you. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, so after the golf club was broken, the killer grabbed a piece of the broken club and plunged it Whoa. into Martha's neck. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Yeah. So it's, like, really brutal. Whoa. And according to the autopsy, Martha didn't die from the severe beating. She died from the shaft of the club being shoved into her. Oh, come on! Yeah. Ah. I know. Now, I mentioned earlier that the police found two pools of blood. There was so much blood at the initial point of attack that it looked like the killer actually left, then came back to the scene about 30 minutes later, and then drug her body under a pine tree, which was about 70 feet away. What? Yeah. 
Isn't that crazy? Why? So somebody left for a bit. Well, God, how could you be? I would. Oh, my God. I mean, obviously, like, I can't compare because, like, I don't have the mind of a killer or anything. But, like, how could you go back? Well, maybe they needed to get help. Holy shit. Yeah. Then, when they came back and, like, drug her under the trees, they pulled Martha's jeans and underwear down to her knees. An exam showed that Martha had not been sexually assaulted. Oh, thank God. Right. There's one good That's thing. Some, yeah, the only good thing out of this. And neighbors say that dogs were hysterically barking, all of them in the neighborhood, around, like, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., but it was mischief night, so it was kind of expected. Some of the neighbors were so disturbed by this, they actually did go outside of their homes to investigate, but they didn't see anything. The Skakels, uh, their live-in maid, heard the dogs barking, and so she sent their live-in tutor to go take a look. So the tutor goes outside the Skakel home and circles around, but didn't see anything. So he just went back inside, but noted that their German shepherd was not barking. Now, some people believe that points to the killer being somebody from the Skakel home because oh. the dog, like, was known to bark at anybody okay. that was unfamiliar. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. Interesting. But it also is a little confusing with that, too, to say that the dog barks at everybody because the live-in tutor, like, this was his first day on the job and the dog didn't bark at him. Oh. So, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Also, during the time frame of 9.30 to 9.45 p.m., Dorothy Moxley, so Martha's mother, was painting the trim around the windows of her second floor home. The wind picked up, so she shut the windows, but was still able to hear loud voices outside. She believed she heard a male teen and the voice sounded really threatening. So she ran to the bathroom and opened the window um, it, so it was on another part of the house. And she was trying to see if she could hear better, but she wasn't able to pick up anything. At 11, she watched the news and about 20 to 30 minutes later, her son John came home and he was exhausted from mischief night. Yeah, who wouldn't be? Right. And so Dorothy goes, hey, Martha's not home yet. And Martha was actually grounded. And so she wasn't allowed to stay out late. Oh, but what better night to be out when you're grounded than on mischief night? Right. Yeah, her mother did give her permission to go out for mischief night because it was like super special. But she had been warned that she better be home early. But still, you know what I'm saying? But what Martha was a good out. kid. <laughs> So, and John was like, you know, my sister would never break a promise like that. So he knew something was weird. And so he hopped in his, in his car and circled the neighborhood to try to find her. That was her brother? Yeah, John. Oh, just a good brother. Yeah, it is. Um, so he was out there for about 30 minutes and then he couldn't find her. So he came home and he told his mom, like, I, sorry, I can't find her. I don't know what's going on. Dorothy was worried and spent all night calling every teen in town. And she called the Skakel residents several times and kept having them wake Tommy up so that they could question him to see, you know, if he knew where she was. At 3.38 a.m., Dorothy called the Greenwich Police Department to report that Martha was missing. At 10 a.m., she marched over to the Skakel residence because she knew that's where Martha told her she would be. Michael Skakel answered the door, and Dorothy said he looked really disheveled. He was messy, barefoot, and looked like he slept in his clothes from the night before. He said he didn't know where Martha was, but she wasn't in his house. I can't remember which one was drinking. Tommy was the one that was drinking. So this was the other one? Yeah, so Tommy's oh. the older brother. I was going to say, because he's probably just freaking hung over like <laughs> but yeah. never mind i mean i've definitely slept in my clothes right me too well, that's why i was before. saying that <laughs> so okay. but yeah i know never mind I did. it's two different ones yeah the golf club used as the murder weapon was a rare golf club 
It was a ladies Tony Penna six iron, and police needed to find out who owned a set of these. They didn't have a search warrant, but they stopped by the Skako residence first. Tommy answered the door and said he watched Martha head to her house around 9.30 p.m., and he said he had to stay home because he had to write a book report about Abraham Lincoln for school the next day. And he told the police the name of his teacher at school, and he was like, you can check it out if you want. When detectives went to the school to question the teacher, she was like, uh, hi, I'm an anthropology teacher, so we don't discuss Abraham Lincoln. What? Yeah. As detectives left the home, they noticed a single golf club was propped against a storage bin. What? It was a Tony Penna 5-iron. Etched into the area below the grip was the name Ann Skakel. The part of the club where the name was etched is the exact piece missing from the scene of the crime. What? So, is it possible that the killer took that piece with them since it has their family member's name etched in it? Oh my god! Either way, no search warrant, no golf club, but <laughs> you can't take well, it. Well, you just, I know, shot I, me right down, man. I literally saw like your fucking face just fall uh, like, huh? So... <laughs> 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 okay. So Dorothy, Martha's mother, did find out that her daughter kept a diary. And she found an entry in it where her daughter said that she had to be very careful because she didn't trust one of the Skako boys, but she didn't say which one. Less than six weeks before her murder, she wrote about how Michael Skako was such an asshole in his actions and words, and he kept telling her that she was leading Tommy on. She mentioned that she should really stop going over there. The Skakel family was known around town for being quite rowdy, and they came from generations of alcoholics. The kids were not disciplined, and things only got worse after their mother died. Ruh-roh. So their father didn't really know how to handle things. So he started, you know, numbing his pain with alcohol and prescription drugs. And then he relied on tutors and maids to all, you know, live in the house and look after the kids while he traveled frequently. The first real suspect, according to the police, was 26-year-old Edward Hammond, and he lived next door to the Moxleys. He said he had been watching the French Connection on TV on the night of the murder. His mother agreed to let the police search their home, and they didn't find anything incriminating. Police brought Edward in for questioning, and they confiscated his clothes because they said his beige pants had a blood-colored stain on the upper left leg, his blue shirt had unknown stains, and his red sweater had unknown stains on the chest. I don't like unknown stains that, mm, nope, I'm not okay with that. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, and it would be weird that... Uh, when they're looking the next day, you're still wearing the clothes. Right. So, uh, the stains on the shirts were food stains, and the stain on the pants were Edward's own blood. He agreed to a polygraph test, and that was deemed inconclusive due to a medication that he was on at the time. So he took the test again a week later after he had, you know, gotten off the medication, and he passed. The focus shifted away from Edward, and now the police were looking at Tommy Skakel, the last known person to see Martha alive, and they were also looking at Ken Littleton, the Skakel's live-in tutor. (laughs) Becky Nielsen is with Edina Realty and is part of the Realtors with Energy team. Becky says, hello, and ghostly greetings from the Otsego Edina Realty office. Let's carve out some time for a market review, because with the new market values, it might leave you shocked and maybe even haunted by these new home prices. Whether you're selling or buying, Becky will be there every step of the way. She wants to help make your home 
beautiful by staging it and getting it ready to sell. Once we get your home inspection report back, we'll unravel all parts of it and dismember it to find the hidden bones to your house. It won't be as scary as you think. Becky will always get back to you. You'll never feel ghosted. She spends most of her days reading her crystal ball to truly understand the current real estate market. Being spooktacular isn't always easy, you know. The trick to selling or buying your house is to choose the right real estate agent. Not listing or buying with Becky would be a grave mistake. Selling or buying your home doesn't have to be terrifying. And remember, Becky would be tickled to her bones to be your realtor. Are you looking for a realtor with energy? Call Becky today! 763-244-6264 It's the middle of the night, and your baby needs a change. The lighting isn't too great, and neither is your patience. That's why emmylouapparel.etsy.com makes sleepers with a two-way zipper. Now, late-night changes are a snap or a zip. Don't worry. When the light is better, your baby will really shine in the cutest sleeper you can buy. See for yourself at emmylouapparel.etsy.com. Use the code KOOLAID, C-O-O-L-A-I-D, to get 15% off your order. That's emmylouapparel.etsy.com. E-M-M-Y-L-O-U-A-P-P-A-R-E-L dot Etsy dot com. The things that make a house a home are the things that make you feel at home. That's where Eason Cassidy Designs comes in. We offer museum quality, fine art prints featuring a wide variety of original designs ranging from watercolor anatomy to literary quotes. Professionally packaged, our prints ship gift-ready and ready for framing. So whether you're looking to express yourself or express your love for someone else, you're sure to find something you love at www.EasonCassidyDesigns.etsy.com. Use promo code KOOLAID40 for 40% off your first purchase. Again, that's E-A-S-O-N-C-A-S-S-I-D-Y designs.etsy.com. Promo code C-O-O-L-A-I-D-4-0. The live-in tutor, Ken Littleton, was on his first day of work in the Skakel home, and that was the day of the murder. Ken was staying in the master bedroom on the second floor of the house, and the police noticed that the bedroom had a terrace facing Walsh Lane, and that would give him a clear view of the Moxley house. On the night of the murder, Ken Littleton had taken the Skakel boys to the Bellhaven Club for dinner, and they all drank, even though they were underage. Oh. Yeah, so I know you had said earlier, like, was Tommy the one that drank or Michael? They both did. Oh, and there you go. Yeah, they was both drunk. When they got back to the house, several friends were waiting for them, and Ken went inside so that he could finish unpacking. He agrees that at 9.30, the housekeeper did ask him to go outside and see why the neighborhood dogs were all barking, but he didn't find anything. Around 10 p.m., Tommy Skakel joined him in the room, and they watched The French Connection on TV together. I guess everyone in town was watching that. (laughs) So, Tommy's story matched Ken's, and Tommy did pass a polygraph test as well. On November 2nd, Rushton Skakel Sr., so this is the father of the Skakels. Okay. uh, He returned home from a trip, and he gave permission for his home to be searched. Police took the Tony Penna Club that they had previously seen in the home. They also found a pair of jeans and blue sneakers with possible bloodstains in a trash bag outside the garage. Hmm? And the jeans had a laundry stamp in the right pocket, and Rushton, the father, believed that the jeans belonged to his son, Michael Skakel, the youngest. Oh... Now, the stains ended up being paint Aww. from a boat. 
Uh, but a long blonde hair similar to Martha's Aww. was found on the jeans. <laughs> We're getting somewhere here. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, Martha's mother and brother agreed to polygraph tests, and they both passed as well. After six weeks, the police had gotten nowhere in this case. So they went back to Martha's friends. So she had gone to the Skakels that night with Helen X and Jeffrey Byrne. They said that at about 9.30 p.m., they had seen Tommy and Martha behind the Skakel home. And the police were like, okay, you got to give us more. What was going on? And they described this as sexual horseplay. Oh, were they doing the dirty? I mean, I don't know. They didn't elaborate, but oh. uh, on the show that I, I watched. I need details here. <laughs> so on Oxygen, they do like reenactments. And um, so on the show, you see like the couple like rolling around in the grass. They were doing the dirty. Okay. <laughs> And so uh, it's wondered, you know, what if Tommy wanted to take things further and then Martha got uncomfortable and didn't want to do that? Oh. Did well, damn it, no one take it back. Right. It wasn't the full dirty. <laughs> it wasn't the full dirty. <laughs> oh, my God. It was only half dirty. <laughs> it was just oh. partial dirties. Oh, man. <laughs> Uh, detectives wanted samples of Tommy's hair, and he agreed to that. His father also gave police permission to access all of Tommy's medical, psychological, and school records. A former attorney worked on the school board, and he was pretty chummy with the Kennedy family. When he got the request to release all of these records, he called the detectives himself and he was like, yeah, that's not happening. Oh, okay. And he also called Tommy's father and said, it is not in your best interest to just release records like this. So the family hired an attorney and sent a letter to the police to withdraw their authorization for records. That same night, Tommy's father, Rushton, had a heart attack that was deemed to be stress-related. Fuck. Right, he survived. After several months, it was clear that the police did not have any strong leads or evidence in the case, and the Moxley family was demanding more. The Detroit Homicide Squad was brought in to look at things and determined that the murderer lived in the neighborhood was acquainted with the victim, and is a troubled young man with an explosive temper. Detectives went to Tommy Skakel's school so they could interview some of his close friends, but they ran into a problem. Tommy didn't have any close friends. He seemed to only be friends with his relatives. Oh, I know. A few days later, detectives did get some interesting information, though. The Skakel's former gardener slash chauffeur had just retired, and he said he knew something. He said the family wasn't trying to protect Tommy. They were protecting Michael. Oh, plot twist! <laughs> According to the gardener, the family was treating Michael different ever since the night of the murder. He said that they were all being, like, extra nice to him. In a weird way. Everyone that was employed in the Skakel home before the murder remained employed, even when they weren't necessarily needed any longer. Well, that's interesting. Like, are they trying to keep everyone, you know, hush-hush? Yeah. I don't know. In April of 1976, Ken Littleton, the tutor, was actually fired for reasons that don't necessarily make sense. The Kennedys kept saying that they didn't want to be involved or associated with this case, but Robert Kennedy Jr. wrote an article stating that Ken Littleton was fired because he got drunk and crashed his car into a tree and abandoned it and explained that this brought the police to the door of the Skakels, so the family had to let him go. There's no record of a police report. And afterwards, claims came out that Ken Littleton had porn magazines in his room. 
and would often go to the Skakel's gazebo naked. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, Ken's like, okay, yeah, right. He denies everything and was really confused about why he was even fired in the first place. But some people wonder if it's a setup. It made him look really guilty and took attention away from the Skakel family. Oh. So. I could see that. Yeah. In July of 1976, Ken Littleton was arrested for grand larceny in Nantucket Island. He was accused of stealing on four separate occasions. It was uh, $4,000 worth of items from three different stores and a boat. That's a lot of items. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of money, really. Yeah. He pled guilty and said that he was drunk on all four occasions. The spotlight was back on him, and the police gave him three polygraph tests and say he was not truthful in answering key questions. Uh Haha. Whoops. So police say that Ken Littleton denied any involvement in Martha Moxley's murder, but the polygraph test indicated that he lied when he said he didn't kill Martha Moxley, when he said he didn't hit her with a golf club, and when he said he didn't know who killed Martha. Those are pretty fucking big questions to uh to tap out on. They are. <laughs> Those are some bad ones. I mean, I don't put a lot of weight in polygraph tests, but yeah, it I sounds don't bad. either. But I'm just I'm just saying, like when it's those three specifically, like yeah. that is a little concerning. Yes, I, I would agree. probably fail a like a polygraph. I would feel so miserable just I'd because be so I'd be scared. shitting my pants like to yeah. do it. I'd be like, I'm so scared. I don't want to do this. Because like I, I would start thinking too many things like, can they tell what I'm thinking? Am I sweating? Yep. Am I jittering too much? What's happening? And then Am they'd I lying? ask me like a yes or no question. And like I'd literally be panicking that I answered wrong in my head. Like it yeah. it just would not end well. Yeah. I know. On June 24th, 1977, the New York Times tried to shake things up a little bit. They printed an article titled, Who Killed Martha Moxley? A Town Wonders. The article is pretty long, but I'll give you some of the key information here. The article stated that the police have traced the golf club or murder weapon to a collection belonging to the Skakels. They also named the suspects as Thomas Skakel and the tutor, Ken Littleton. It was reported that Tommy Skakel was the nephew of Ethel Skakel, uh, Kennedy, and this was a tidbit that the Kennedys tried to keep quiet through the years. In the Greenwich time, Ken's mother, Maria Littleton, said that the Moxley murder really changed her son. He was raised as a good Christian boy, and now he was a brooding shell of a man who was unable to hold jobs, tried to take his own life, and abused alcohol and drugs. She said he became paranoid and believed the Skakels and the Kennedys were trying to pin everything on him. Oh, no. And so Ken's ex-wife, Mary Baker, said that he was a heavy drinker that kept having mental breakdowns, and he did threaten to kill her one time. But she said that she never actually believed he would hurt her, and she also did not think he was involved in the murder. It just really destroyed him. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. Which I actually find that kind of interesting. Like, as an ex-wife, she could have totally thrown him under the bus. Oh, yeah, 100%. But, uh, yeah, the way she described him, too, on the show, she was like, you know, I think that he was a totally different person after the murder because everybody was coming after him. Right. So John Moxley, Martha's brother, actually went to see Ken at one point on his own. He wanted to question him about the murder, and in the uh, documentary on Oxygen, he said he did not feel that Ken was the murderer. He felt really strongly about this. John felt that he just got tragically mixed up in this whole nightmare and truly believes that Michael Skakel is the murderer. I feel Ken is the uh the the tutor or whatever. Ken's the living tutor. Yeah, okay, so I really don't there's nothing that's been pointing me towards him at all. I think that it is the worst timing in the universe yes. that he started on that night. 
And and I get where people are coming from with that, but also, like, if you're going to do something like this, why in the hell would you do it on the first night? And, like you said earlier, too, and this is what I got hung up on the entire time when people are saying it's got to be Ken. I'm like, okay, first off, when you look at the actual murder itself, it feels real passionate. 100%. Yeah. How would it Ken absolutely be passionate does. about Martha? He didn't know her. Exactly. No, and I really do feel like this had to have been somebody she knew. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It just that piece doesn't fit in my head. I mean, it's not, it's obviously not always, but a, a majority of the time. Yeah. When it, that overkill is involved, it's usually because it's personal. And I typically tend to side with the family that's involved. So yeah. if the family of the victim says this is who I believe it is, I would lean more towards yeah. that because they have different information. I agree. Yep. Also, Ken Littleton wasn't the only one who was a mess after Martha's murder. In March of 1978, Michael Skakel, so he's the youngest Skakel um, out of the two. Okay. So he was now 17 years old. He was driving around drunk with a friend one night. Police signaled for him to stop, but Michael decided to speed up and a high-speed chase ensued. The chase ended when Michael smashed the car into a telephone pole. His friend Debbie broke her leg and Michael didn't have any injuries. He was arrested and charged with speeding, unlicensed driving, failure to comply with an officer's orders, and drunk driving. Boy, he's lucky they both survived. Right. Michael pled guilty, and they kept this whole thing real hush-hush. His father drove Michael directly to the airport while he was still in handcuffs, and two men drug him off and put him on a plane and sent him to a rehab center called uh elon school he was like we need no more family drama you out of here exactly now the school has been very controversial in their practices uh they just have weird behavior modification rituals okay they believed that public humiliation is therapeutic let that sink in oh boy Students were physically restrained, deprived of sleep, and malnourished. Holy shit. Okay. There was a resident of the school named Phil Williams who died in 1982 after participating in Elon's ring, which is where students are forced to fight each other. Oh my god. Yeah, it's real bad. In the police reports, there was something very interesting hidden in the interviews. On the night of the murder, we know that Martha's friend, Helen X was sitting in the back of the car. She saw Tommy and Martha outside of the vehicle making out and referred to that interaction as sexual horseplay. After she was questioned more, Helen mentioned that she saw Martha push Tommy. Then he pushed her back and fell on top of her. Later in the report, Helen said that Tommy had received a severe head injury at the age of four. She said he fell out of the back seat of a family car. Oh, my God. And this caused him to become violent very suddenly and would pretty much, I guess, he would lose consciousness. And his episodes of rage could last between 15 to 20 minutes or up to two to three hours. Holy crap. His father was always able to physically control him when it happened, but as we know, his father wasn't home. He was on a trip when the murder happened. So this information pretty much put Tommy back at the top of the suspect list, but the request for a search warrant had been denied by the state attorney. Perhaps the rumors of a cover-up were true. The Greenwich police were told to tread lightly when it came to investigating the Skakels. What? Yeah. So the Skakels seriously have, like, a shit ton of money, and they're connected to the Kennedys. Right. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Tommy had agreed very early on to take a polygraph test and was told that he passed. If a polygraph is given too early on a case before police actually know the details, they aren't able to ask the proper questions. 
So that means that Tommy should never have been cleared because the test was taken too soon. I did not know. I didn't either. Yeah. I guess I never considered it being too soon. Yeah. I always thought you you, want to do it quick. But no, the way it was explained is really interesting because like if the police ask the wrong thing based off of assumptions that they initially have from the crime scene, then they can accidentally clear you. Oh, my God. Interesting. Because it's false information. It didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Everyone that was at the Skakel house on the night of the murder agreed. They saw Michael Skakel leave to go to his cousin Jimmy's house around 9.15 p.m., and the ride is about, like, 15 to 20 minutes long. It's believed that Martha was murdered about 10 o'clock, so he couldn't have really returned home in time to do it. It sounds like John Kennedy Jr. believed that Tommy Skakel was the one involved in the murder. He told a friend that the Kennedys were allegedly involved in paying hush money to some officials to protect Tommy. There's also another clue that points to a possible cover-up. In the police reports, the date that they found the golf club in the Skakel residence changed. What? Uh Uh-huh. Stephen Barron, the chief of police, said that the clubs might not be a useful clue if they find the owner. It might not just lead them right to the killer. The chief of police say that they told the New York Times they were still looking for the Tony Pena irons three days after they had already located them at the Skakels. Tommy's father was able to come to an agreement that was worthless to the investigation. Martha's father and Tommy's father both hired doctors to examine Tommy Skakel. The two doctors were allowed to share results with each other, but they couldn't share results with the police lawyers or Martha's father. Well, yeah. Okay, so... So it's fucking useless. Right. But it ended the police investigating Tommy. Can you believe that? I uh, So they're basically like, okay, here's two doctors, uh, and they're going to do a full workup on you, but nobody's going to know the results. I don't get this. And now you're cleared. Okay. When the tutor, Ken Littleton, was questioned in 1976, he told the police that he didn't know Martha Moxley, never met her, and he actually did not believe that Tommy was involved. He thought it was Michael, and he told them that he was actually scared of Michael. Ken explained that he went golfing with Michael and a few other people at the country club. Michael walked ahead of the group, and when they all caught up, they say that he had crushed the head of a chipmunk <gasps> and put a no, tea no, no, through no. it like a crucifix. No, 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 no. I know. There was someone inside the Skakel home that puts Michael at the scene of the crime, not Tommy. Andrea was inside the house drinking tea with Julie Skakel. So Julie um, is a sibling of Tommy and Michael. So she had her friend over and they stayed inside for mischief night. I think they were too young. At around 9.30 p.m., she heard two voices and recognized them as Martha and her friend Helen X. When the car pulled away from the house to head to Jimmy's that night, Michael was not in the back seat of the car. This was the first person to place Michael back at the house that night. Oh, shit. Yeah. We talked about how Michael was sent to that sketchy Elon school right after Martha's murder. Yep. Well, someone who was there with him said that Michael confessed to the murder when he was drunk one night. What? 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 Mm. What? Michael apparently mentioned that his lawyer recommended that he hide at Elon to avoid being charged with murder. Oh! So. Hey, that actually. Mm Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, the dad was serious. Like, he went, got his kid in handcuffs and made him go to this school. Yeah. So, I don't know. Maybe because he was like, if he's in there too long with the local police, they're going to find out. Yeah, for sure. Maybe I just need to get them the hell out of town now. I don't know. Well, and also, they for sure didn't want that to blow up in the newspapers. Not with everything else they're dealing with. Yeah, it's not, not a good look. Not cute. 
1994, crime writer Leonard Levitt received a call from an anonymous male. The caller said that they had information about the case that would be worth the wait. The caller contacted Levitt again in 1995 and explained that there had been an analysis done by two former FBI colleagues who had run the Bureau's Behavioral Science Lab in Washington. They had studied hundreds of serial killers, including sociopaths. They had retired from the FBI, and then they formed their own consulting company known as the Academy Group, uh, and this was in Virginia. The Academy looked into the Martha Moxley case and noted there was a lack of defense wounds on her arms and hands, and nobody heard screams that night. The Academy believes that Martha knew her attacker, and that pretty much saying. rules out Ken Littleton, the tutor. Because it was his first day on the job. He didn't know Martha. And that's true. With them only being 200 yards away, they absolutely would have heard screaming if there was. Yeah. The report says that they believe the killer acted out of rage, maybe after Martha rejected sexual advances. She was attacked in her driveway, and this shows that the murderer knew their victim, knew when she would be going home, and knew her habits and how she walked up the driveway and across the lawn to her front door. They believed that the evidence all pointed in a very clear direction. And to find that out, you, you gotta ass. come back to the next one. I next literally week. knew it. Did you see my head shoot up as soon as you said <laughs> yeah. it? I was like, are you kidding me? I'm telling you, this case is so, so strange. Because it keeps pointing back in the same direction and at the same people. But yeah, nothing happens but with it. It's, there's really no resolution on it yeah. yet. Uh, and next week, you're going to see how all of a sudden everybody's stories change. What? Yeah. And it's real interesting. All right. All right. So make sure to... Follow us on any of your podcast apps. Tell us the stories you want to hear. Like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Leave us a voicemail. Uh, that's at www.drinkingthekoolaid.com. Send us your listener stories uh, to our email or on the website. You know what to do. Give us a five-star review if you love us. Tell your friends. Tell your cats. Um, Bye. bye. Hey, Megan. Hey, Hannah. This is Andre from Greenville, South Carolina. I just wanted to let you know how much I love listening to your podcast each and every week. Um, I love your, you're just so fucking funny. And um, I love the way um, Megan says wagon and fancy French talk and all that good stuff. And, um, and Hannah, you're just, you're just delightful to listen to. So um, just keep up the good work. I've contacted you a few times on Facebook. You guys are the best. Keep up the good work. Love you both very much. Love your uh, love your cats. Um, bye.